the firestorm of Apollo. We now turn to the mythology of the Latins, as preserved in the pages of Ovid, one of the greatest of the poets of ancient Rome. There is a twist at the end of this tale. Here we have the burning of the world, involved in the myth of Phaeton, son of Phobos. Apollo, the son, who drives the chariot of his father. He cannot control the horses of the sun, they run away with him. They come so near to the earth as to set fire on it, and Phaeton is last killed by Jove, as he killed Typhon in the Greek legends, to save heaven and earth from complete ruin. This is the story of the firestorm as treated by a civilized mind, explained by a myth, and decorated with the flowers and foliage of poetry. We shall see many things in the narrative of Ovid, which strikingly confirm our comet theory. Phaeton, to prove that he is really the son of Phobos, the sun, demands from his parents the right to drive his chariot for one day. The sun god reluctantly consents, not without many pleadings, that the infatuated and rash boy would give up his inconsiderable ambition. Phaeton persists, and the old man says, even the ruler of vast Olympus, who hurls the ruthless bolts with his terrific right hand, cannot guide this chariot. And yet, what have we greater than Jupiter? The first part of the road is steep, and such as the horses, though fresh in the morning, can hardly climb. In the middle of the high heaven, it is high aloft, whence it is often a source of fear, even to myself, to look down upon the sea and the earth, and my breast trembles with fearful apprehensions. The last stage is a steep descent, and requires a sure command of the horses. Besides, the heavens are carried round with a constant rotation, and carrying with them the lofty stars, and whirl them with rapid revolution. Against this I have to contend, and that force which overcomes all other things, does not overcome me, and I am carried in a contrary direction to the rapid world. Here we seem to have a glimpse of some higher and older learning, mixed with astronomical errors of the day. Ovid supposes that the rapid world to move revolve one way, while the sun appears to move another. Unless of course this is a riddle, and it is his worship which is carried in a contrary direction to the rapid world. But Phaeton insists on undertaking the dreadful task. The doors of Aurora are opened, her halls were filled with roses, the stars disappear, the hours yoke the horses filled with the dukes of Ambrosia. The father anoints the face of his son with a hallowed drug, that he may better endure the great heat. I mentioned DMT in the tall grasses and here we find a hallowed drug, meaning a sacred drug. As mentioned in the previous documentary, the plant life and mammals that arose from this comet dust in the Eocene period would possibly be a hostile invasive species due to their composition being different to the surrounding earth, which in turn I believe created the psychedelic plants and the predators. Modern ethnomycologists such as Danny Staples identify Ambrosia with the hallucinogenic mushroom Amanita muscaria. It was the food of the gods, their Ambrosia, and nectar was the pressed sap of its juices. We now understand clearly what is meant by being filled with the juice of Ambrosia. 
Phaeton, the reins are handed to him, and the fatal race begins. Phobos has advised him not to drive too high, or thou wilt set on fire the signs of the heavens, the constellations, nor too low, or he will consume the earth. In the meantime, the swift Pyroes, and Eos, and Aethon, the horses of the sun, and Phlegon, the fourth, filled the air with names, sending forth flames, and beat the barriers with their feet. They take the road. They cleave resisting clouds, and raise aloft their wings. They had passed the east winds that had risen from the same parts, but the weight of Phaeton was light, and such as the horses that the horses of the sun could not feel, and the yoke was deficient of its wanted weight. As soon as the horses perceived this, they rush on and leave the beaten track, and do not run in the order which they did before. Phaeton himself becomes alarmed, and knows not which way to turn, the reins entrusted to him, nor does he know where the way is, nor if he did know, could he control them. Then, for the first time, did the cold trions grow warm with sunbeams, and attempt in vain to be dipped in the sea that was forbidden to them. The trions would be the Pleiades, the Trions are the seven stars to which the Anunnaki were allocated. This next part has the elements of Kubla Khan, namely the Dome of Ice, and attempt in vain to be dipped in the sea that was forbidden to them, which is situated next to the icy pole, being before torpid with cold and formidable to no one, grew warm and regained new rage for the heat. And they saw that thou, Boots, scoured off in a mighty bustle, although thou wert but slow and thy cart hindered thee. But when from the height of the skies the unhappy Phaeton looked down upon the earth lying far, far beneath he grew pale, his knees shook with a sudden terror, and in a light so great, darkness overspread his eyes, and now he wished that he had never touched the horses of his father. And now he is sorry that he knew his descent, and prevailed in his request now desiring to be called the son of Merops. What can he do? He is stupefied. He neither lets go of the reins, nor is able to control them. In his fright, too, he sees strange objects scattered everywhere in various parts of the heavens and the forms of the huge wild beasts. There is a spot where the scorpion bends his arms into two curves and with his tail and claws bending on either side, he extends his limbs through the space of the two signs of the zodiac. As soon as the youth beheld him, wet with the sweat of black venom, and threatening wounds with the barbed point of his tail, bereft of sense, he let go of the reins in a chill of horror. The stinger of Scorpio, wet with the sweat of black venom, extends his limbs through the space of the two signs of the zodiac. That would mean that Scorpio is thrice great. I said this may be a 6,000 year cycle, and here we have Scorpio in two other positions on the Zodiac. Scorpio to Pisces and Cancer. I believe this is the meaning 
referred to by the Aztec calendar, which means we are way past due. We can compare the course, which Ovid tells us, Phaeton pursued through the constellations, past the Great Serpent and Boots, and close to the venomous Scorpion, with the orbit of Donati's Comet in 1858, as given in Shellen's great work, Spectrum Analysis. The path described by Ovid shows that the comet came from the north part of the heavens, and this agrees what we know of the drift. The markings indicate that it came from the north. The horses now range at large. They go through the air of an unknown region. They rush on the stars fixed in the sky. They approach the earth. The moon, too, wonders that her brother's horses run lower than her own, and the scorched clouds send forth smoke. And each region that is most elevated is caught by the flames and cleft open. The Grand Corpure, the Great Break, cleft open, meaning split asunder. It makes vast chasms, its moisture being carried away. The grass grows pale, the trees and their foliage are burned up, and the dry standing corn affords fuel for its own destruction. But I am complaining of trifle ills. The flames turn whole nations into ashes. The woods, together with the mountains, are on fire. Athos burns, and the Sicilian Taurus, and Tomolus, and the Great Plain of Ida. We seen in a previous documentary the mention of Lioness, which was a stretch of land running from Britain to Sicily. Mount Ida is in Crete. In ancient times, the Idean cave, the cave of the goddess, Dia. Dia was venerated by Minoans and Hellens alike. By Greek times, the cave was rededicated to Zeus, meaning this cave was attributed to Zeus. The word Idean is derived from Idaea or Idaia, and this is the name of several figures in Greek mythology. It means she who comes from Ida or she who lives on Ida and is often associated with Mount Ida in Crete and Mount Ida in the Troad. This could well be the Celtic goddess of the plain of Ida. I will read that line once more to continue the narrative. The woods, together with the mountains, are on fire, and the Sicilian Taurus and Tumulus and Ida. Now dry, but once most famed for its springs, The Helicon, the resort of the Virgin Muses. And Hamus, not yet called Pathgrian. That name is certainly not Pythagorean, and the alternative that I see would be Pathogen. Etna burns intensely with redoubled flames, and Parnassus with its two summits, and Eryx, and Synthus, and Orthreus, and Rehodope, at length to be despoiled of its snows, and Mimas, and Dindyma, and Mycale, and Scytheron, created for the sacred rites. Nor does the cold avail even Scythia. The Caucasus is on fire, and Ossa with Pindos, and Olympus, greater than them both, and the lofty Alps, and the cold-bearing Apennines. Then indeed, Phaeton beholds the world, sees fire on all sides, 
and he cannot endure heat so great. The scorching air, as though from a deep furnace, and perceives his own chariot to be on fire, and neither is he able now to bear the ashes and the emitted embers, and on every side he is involved in a heated smoke covered with a pitchy darkness. He knows not what he is doing, he knows not where he is going, nor where he is, and is hurried away at the pleasure of the winged steeds. Then was Libya, the Sahara, made dry by the heat, the moisture being carried off. Then with dishevelled hair, the nymphs lamented the springs and lakes. Nor do rivers that have banks destined remain secure. Tanaeus smokes in the midst of its waters, and the aged Peneus, and the Tothriantian Kaikos, and rapid Ismenos. The Babylonian Euphrates, too, was on fire. Arontes was in flames, and the swift Thermodon and Ganges, and Phasis, and Ister. Alpheus boils, the banks of Spurtius burn, and the gold which Tagus carries is molten in the flames. The river birds too, which made famous the Maeonian banks with song, grew hot in the middle of Chiesta. The Egyptian Nile, frightened, fled to the remotest parts of the earth, and concealed his head, which still lies hid. His seven last mouths are empty, seven channels without any streams. The same fate dries up the Ismarian rivers. Hebius, together with Streamon and the Hesperian streams, the Rhine, the Rhone, and the Po, and the Tiber, to which was promised the sovereignty of the world. In other words, according to these Roman traditions, here poetized, the heat dried up the rivers of Europe, Asia, and Africa, in short, all of the known world. Ovid continues, all the ground bursts asunder, and through the chinks, the light penetrates into Tartarus. We have seen that during the Drift Age, the great clefts in the earth, the fjords of the north of Europe and America occurred, and we shall see hereafter, according to a central American legend, the red rocks boiled up through the earth at this time. The ocean too is contracted, says Ovid, and that which lately was sea is a surface of parched sand, and the mountains which the deep sea has covered start up and increase the number of the scattered Cyclades, which is a cluster of islands in the Aegean Sea, surrounding Delos as though with a circle. The fishes sank to the bottom, and the crooked dolphins do not care to raise themselves on the surface into the air as usual. The bodies of sea calves float lifeless on their backs, on top of the water. The story too is that even Nereus himself, Doris and their daughters, lay hidden in heated caverns. All this could scarcely have been imagined and yet it agrees precisely with what we cannot but believe to have been the facts. Here we have an explanation of how that vast body of vapour, which afterward constituted great snow banks, 
The ice sheets and river torrents rose into the air. The world of science tells us that to make a world wrapping ice sheet two miles thick, all the waters of the ocean must have been evaporated. To make it one mile thick would take one half of the waters of the earth. And here we find that this Roman poet, who is repeating the legends of his race, and who knew nothing about a drift or an ice age, telling us that the water boiled in the streams, that the bottom of the Mediterranean lay exposed as a bed of dry sand, that the fish floated dead on the surface, or fled away to the great abyss of the ocean, and that even the sea gods themselves hid in the heated caverns. Ovid continues, three times had Neptune ventured, with stern countenance, to thrust his arms out of the water. Three times he was unable to endure the scorching heat of the air. This is no doubt a reminiscence of those human beings who sought safety in the water, retreating downward into the deep as the heat reduced its level occasionally lifting up their heads to breathe the torrid and tainted air. However, the genial earth, as she was surrounded by the sea, amid the waters of the main, the springs dried up on every side which had hidden themselves in the bowels of their cavernous parent, burnt up, lifted up her all-productive face as far as her neck, and placed her hand to her forehead, and shaking all things with a vast trembling, she sank down a little and retired below the spot where she wanted to be. Here we are reminded of the Bridge of Bifrost, spoken of in the last Comet documentary, which as I have shown was probably a prolongation of land reaching from Atlantis to Europe, and which the Norse legend tells us sank down under the feet of the forces of Muspelheim in the day of Ragnarok, the darkness of the gods. And thus she spoke with a parched voice. O sovereign of the gods, if thou approve of this, if I have deserved it, why do thy lightnings linger? Let me, if doomed to perish by the force of fire, perish by thy flames, and alleviate my misfortune by being the author of it. With difficulty, indeed, do I open my mouth for these very words. Behold my scorched hair, and such a quantity of ashes over my eyes. These would be the drift deposits. So much, too, over my features, and dost thou give this as my recompense. What follows is a perfect example of how to change the minds of the people. Remember that the Idean cave was rededicated to Zeus, which originally belonged to the mother goddess. She, the original god, complains, this as a reward for my fertility and duty, in that I endure wounds from the crooked plough and harrows, and I am harassed all the year through, in that I supply green leaves for the cattle and corn, and wholesome food for mankind, 
and frankincense for yourselves. But still, suppose I am deserving of destruction. Why have the waves deserved this? Why has thy brother, Neptune, deserved it? And why do they recede still farther from the sky? But if regard neither for my brother nor myself influences thee, still have consideration for thy own skies. Look around on either side, see how each pole is smoking. If the fire shall injure them, thy palace will fall in ruins. See, Atlas himself is struggling, and hardly can he bear the glowing heavens on his shoulders. If the sea, if the earth, if the palace of heaven perish, we are all then jumbled into the old chaos again. Save it from the flames, if aught still survives, and provide for the preservation of the universe. Thus spoke the earth, nor indeed could she any longer endure the vapour, nor say more, and she withdrew her face within herself, and the caverns neighbouring to the shades below. The early readers of this story would have been led to believe by the words that Zeus was the Almighty, but as you can see, he has been rededicated as the Almighty. But the Omnipotent Father, having called the gods above to witness, and him too, who had given the chariot to Phaeton, that unless he gives assistance, all things will perish in direful ruin. The mounts aloft to the highest eminence, from which he wants to spread the clouds over the spacious earth, and from which he moves his thunders, and burls the brandished lightnings. But then, he had neither clouds that he could draw over the earth, nor showers that could pour down from the sky. That is to say, so long as the great meteor shone in the sky, and for some time after, the heat was so intense to permit the formation of either clouds or rain. These could only come with coolness and condensation. He thundered aloud, and darted the poised lightning from his right ear against the charioteer, and at the same moment deprived him both of life and his seat and by his ruthless fire restrained the flames. The horses are affrighted and make a bound in the opposite direction. They shake the yoke from their necks, and disengage themselves from the torn harness. In one place lie the reins, in another the axle tree wrenched from the pole. In another part are the spokes of the broken wheels, and the fragments of the chariot, torn into pieces, are scattered far and wide. But Phaeton, the flames consuming his yellow hair, is hurled headlong, and is borne in a long track through the air, as sometimes a star is seen to fall from the serene sky, although it really has not fallen. But still it depicts Phaeton, Apollo, as a meteor, the fallen angel. Him, the great Eridanus, receives in a part of the world far distant from his country, and bathes his foaming face.
the Hesperian Naiads commit his body, smoking from the three forked flames, to his tomb, and inscribe these verses on the stone. Here is Phaeton buried, the driver of his father's chariot, which, if he did not manage, still he miscarried in a great attempt. But his wretched father, the sun, had hidden his face, overcast with bitter sorrow, and if only we can believe it, one day passed without the sun. The flames of the fire afforded light, and there was some advantage in that disaster, as there was no daily return of the sun to mark the time, that in fact the one day of darkness was probably a long duration, it may have endured for years. Then follows Ovid's description of the morning of Clymene and the daughters of the sun, and the Naiads for the dead Phaeton. Cisnus, king of Liguria, grieves for Phaeton until he is transformed into a swan, reminding one of the Central American legend which states that in one day men were turned into gooselings or geese, a reminiscence perhaps of those who saved themselves from the fire by taking refuge in the waters of the seas. But of course I have to remind you that being given a bird form in Babylon is also the curse of the stinger of Scorpio, the Anzu bird, known as the rock, meaning the darkness, the black bird. And here, Cisnus becomes a new bird, but he trusts himself not to the heavens or the air, as being mindful of the fire unjustly sent from thence. He frequents the pools and wide lakes, and a boring fire, he chooses the streams, the very contrary of flames. The father of Phaeton, the son, in squalid garb, and destitute of his comeliness. Just as he wanted to be, he suffers an eclipse of the disc, abhors both the light, himself and the day, and gives his mind up to grief, and adds resentment to his sorrow. In other words, the poet is now describing the Age of Darkness, which as we have seen, must have followed the conflagration when the condensed vapour wrapped the world in a vast cloak of cloud. The sun refuses again to go on his daily journey, just as we shall see hereafter in the American legends. He refuses to stir until threatened or coaxed into action. All the deities, says Ovid, stand around the sun as he says such things, and they entreat him with supplant voice, not to be determined to bring darkness over the world. At length, they induce the enraged and bereaved father to resume his task. But the omnipotent father, Jupiter, surveys the vast walls of heaven and carefully searches that no part impaired by the violence of the fire may fall into ruin. After he has seen them to be secure, and in their own strength, he examines the earth and the works of man. Yet a care for his own Arcadia is more particularly his object. He restores too the springs and rivers that had not yet dared to flow. He gives grasses to the earth, DMT, green leaves to the trees, and orders the injured forests again to be green. The arrival of the alien god and the dawn of the new fauna, pagan duplication of the Garden of Eden. The work of renovation has begun. Something appears to be terraforming the earth. The condensing moisture renews the springs and rivers. The green mantle of Venger once more covers the earth, and from the waste places 
the beaten and burnt trees put forth new sprouts. The legend ends like Ragnarok, in a beautiful picture of a regenerated world. If we deprive this poem of the myth of Phaeton, we have a very faithful tradition of the conflagration of the world caused by the comet. The cause of the trouble is something which takes place high in the heavens. And here I enjoy the wording. It rushes through space. It threatens the stars. It traverses particular constellations. It is disastrous. It has yellow hair. It is associated with great heat. It sets the world on fire. It dries up the seas. Its remains are scattered over the earth. It covers the earth with ashes. The sun ceases to appear. There is a time when he is, as it were, in eclipse. And after a while, he returns. Verger comes again upon the earth. The springs and rivers reappear. The world is renewed or assimilated, depending on perspective. During this catastrophe, man has hidden himself, swan-like, in the waters. Or, the intelligent children of the earth take themselves to deep caverns for protection from the conflagration. How completely does all this accord, in chronological order and in its details, with the Scandinavian legend, and with what reason teaches us must have been the consequences to the earth if a comet had fallen upon it. And the most ancient of the ancient world, the nation that is said to stand farthest back in historical time, the Egyptians believed that this legend of Phaeton really represented the contact of the earth with a comet. When Solon, the Greek lawgiver, 600 years before the Christian era, he talked with the priests of Sais about the deluge of Ducleon. This would be the son of Prometheus. I quote the following from Plato's Dialogues, XI 517, Timaeus. Thereupon, one of the priests, who was of very great age, said, Oh, Solon, Solon. You Helens are but children. There is never an old man who is an Helen. So long, hearing this, said, What do you mean? I mean to say, he replied, that in mind you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science, hooray, with age. And I will tell you the reason of this. There have been, and there will be again, many destructions of mankind, arising out of many causes. There is a story, which even you have preserved, that once upon a time, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies the declination of the bodies moving around the earth and in the heavens, and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, recurring at long intervals of time. When this happens, those who live upon the mountains, and in dry and lofty places, are more liable to destruction, than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. This is the complete opposite of the Druids, of the Druids' narrative. As the great flood and fire come in the same instance, those by the shore are the first to be affected. Those at high ground, under granite, are protected from both fire and flood. Apollo is the Lord of Light, with elements of the darkness. Apollo would frequently strike people with his arrows. Ancient Greeks identified them with plague and sudden death in general to punish others.
please hit that notification bell to ensure that you are notified of each upload. Share, like, comment and subscribe to support the channel for more M7 documentaries.